it's time uh, for the uh, first speaker. That's our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Professor Adrian Vermeulen uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, Ralph Tyler, uh, Junior Professor of Constitutional Law. Uh, he will uh, have a speech uh, uh, entitled uh, Common Good Constitutionalism. Uh, before uh, coming to the law uh, school, uh, he was the Bernard Metzler Professor uh, of Law at the University of Chicago. He is the author and co author of uh, nine books, uh, uh, most recently, Law's Abnegation from Law's Empire to the Administrative uh, State, uh, the Constitution of Risk, uh, and uh, the System of the uh, Constitution. He was elected to the American Academy of uh, Sciences in 2012. So please, yeah, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Monsignor, and thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with this wonderful distinguished group, eminences, your excellency, deans, uh, very grateful. I love being in Poland, I've been here several times for professional events, but I've also been here several times as a sports parent, as a dad. Um, so my kids do uh, fencing, sword fighting. Uh, I think in Polish the word might be zermierka. Is that close? Yeah, it was pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I tell them the academic events are just as you know, competitive and stressful as the as the fencing events, uh, perhaps even more deadly sometimes, um, but they don't, they don't buy that. So I'm going to talk today about um, common good constitutionalism, the, the subject of my most recent book. Um, the idea is to translate or adapt the classical legal tradition to our current world, although inevitably I'll have to speak to some degree about debates in the U.S. and the common law world. Part of my aim is precisely um, to reconnect American law with its European and classical roots. So I, I hope, uh, in fact, you'll take the talk as in part a reflection on and an effort to connect American constitutional law with um, both uh, the legacy of uh, St. John Paul uh, and with uh, Article I of the 1997 Constitution of the Republic of Poland which states that the Republic of Poland shall be the common good of all its citizens. And I take this provision to stand squarely in the broad mainstream of the Western legal tradition, um, despite the discontinuities of the, uh, of the, of the communist period. Of course, that, that mainstream of the Western legal tradition has many tributaries and complicated branches. Still, there is a larger continuity that connects the provision I mentioned um, to the very similar uh, first article of um, the 1780 Constitution of my home state of Massachusetts in the Northeastern United States, um, whose uh, uh, first article specifies that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good, and connects it as well to the U.S. Constitution's own preamble which specifies that one of the master aims of the Constitution is to promote the general welfare. That provision, in turn, has well-known and interesting connections to the very famous Polish Constitution of 3 May 1791, often called the writ first written Constitution in Europe, which specifies that it is made, among other aims, for the general welfare. So all of these, um, in my view, are drawing on a common well, uh, common sources, that goes right back uh, through the uh, use commune of uh, medieval Europe um, and indeed back to the concepts of the bonum commune and utilitas um, that were central to the thinking of um, Roman lawyers. And any account of constitutionalism that ignores the central place of the bonum commune in Western legal theory is an inadequate account. This has to be at the center of our thinking about law. So what I call common good constitutionalism aims to participate in this tradition. 
And it's an alternative to two, um, two other competitors, which in my view are both forms of what I call liberal legalism. The two other competitors are left liberal progressive legalism, which claims that constitutional law should be a restlessly dynamic liberationist project and which sees human anthropology as plastic, subject to self-recreation, self-revision by the human subject. Uh, the other competitor is uh, what I call uh, right liberalism, which in the United States um, takes uh, as its constitutional catchword the term uh, originalism, which is the idea that the Constitution must be read according to the original public meaning of the document as the moment of, an, of its enactment. Now these two um, engage in a kind of uh, endless dance of enmity, but I think the enmity is actually superficial. I think they're actually mirror images of each other and that both are aspects or variants of the same view because they share the same premises about the relationship of law to political morality. Both in one way or another de deny the independently binding force of the natural law. Either in the progressive case because they don't think natural law exists or in the originalist case because the belief that natural law is binding only insofar as it is incorporated into positive law rather than being binding of, of its own force. Against both camps, I argue that the classical tradition should be explicitly adapted as the matrix within which American judges read our constitution, our statutes, and our administrative law. So in this way, I'm trying to re recover this profound connection with the classical European tradition. The project, therefore, has both a general part and a particular part. And this is a duality that's typical of the classical legal framework, which sees law as resting on both uh, general principles and principles specific um, to a particular jurisdiction. Um, I, the book speaks to both uh, the um, general methodology of common good constitutionalism and to its specific instantiation in the American constitutional order. Um, and those are, in a sense, detachable. You can subscribe to the methodological framework while very much quarreling with my particular interpretation of American constitutional law. Um, that's, um, uh, that's straightforward. What happened uh, to the US? What happened constitutionally? My view is that American public law suffers from a kind of amnesia, a strange kind of forgetting of its own traditions and origin. Putting aside the work of a few legal historians and other specialists, our laws all but lost the memory of its own formative influences in the jus commune. So the classical law was heavily influential in England in a somewhat variant form. That's one of the things we've re sort of rediscovered in the past generation um, by uh, legal scholars like uh, Dick Helmholtz and others. Uh, and both the English and continental streams of the jus commune influenced Americans right from the beginning. Uh, throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th. It was, it was ex explicit in legal practice. Um, to again refer to my uh, home state of uh, Massachusetts, um, some of the most uh, famous opinions contributed by uh, some of our most famous judges are in essence commentaries on the famous um, uh, three-part maxim of the jurist Ulpian, juris precepti uh, uh, sunt haec uh, honeste vivere alterum non laidere suum quique tribuere. And these are express in the um, opinions of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, um, or it's actually called the Judicial Court, uh, uh, right through the, right through the uh, 19th century. And this is true all over. It's all true all over in America. Um, and this classical legal world doesn't begin to break down until around World War I uh, with the advent of kind of aggressive form of legal positivism um, propounded uh, by certain American judges. The precise timing, I, I won't bore you with the whole 
uh, uh, history of uh, law in 20th century America, but it's clear that by the 1960s, some sort of radical shift has occurred and that um, it is now just taken as common ground uh, that um, uh, the positive law does not exhaust the content of law. By contrast, the classical legal tradition says that the positive law, while worthy of great respect in its sphere, is contained within a larger objective order of background legal principles and can only be interpreted in accordance with those principles. I'm not suggesting it's just a simple return to the classical legal tradition uh, and especially not to its particular rules. Um, that's neither desirable nor possible. Even if it were feasible, you might just recreate the very conditions that cause the breakdown. But I do think that the core theoretical insights and jurisprudential principles of the classical tradition can be adapted and recovered and translated into our world. They're not so remote that we can't understand them. In fact, one of my claims in the book is that Judges inevitably call upon them implicitly all the time, sometimes without realizing that they are doing so. So it is impossible not to speak the language of truth. It's impossible to always speak in a false register. So sometimes judges, uh, whether um, knowingly or unknowingly, slip into the language of the natural law. Um, and this uh, is quite obvious um, in opinion after opinion. Well, um, if this is right, then what we can recover for uh, American law, and uh, hopefully generally, is the thought from the classical legal tradition that law should be seen as a reasoned ordering to the common good or what Ulpian called um, the, a practical art of goodness and fairness, an act of purposive and reasoned governance that promotes the good of citizens and subjects of the laws, members of a flourishing political community, and ultimately as members of the community of peoples and nations. All officials have a duty and corresponding authority to promote the common good although they should do so in a manner consistent with the requirements of their particular roles, and I'll come back to this shortly. I think this conception embodies the best of our tradition. It's the union of well-ordered reason with public authority. Classical law takes positive law very seriously. It treats enacted texts as the products of reasoned deliberation of public authorities who give specific content to the law where background legal principles are general um, or uh, leave issues to discretionary choice. Um, so this is the process of determination whereby um, general background principles are made concrete for use in a particular jurisdiction. The uh, natural law may tell us, for example, that um, after some point people have a uh, a right um, to uh, repose from the threat of lawsuits, that um, at some point one should not have to worry about being sued for past conduct, but it is up to the civil lawmaker to make that specific with a statute of limitations and endless complications about which possible offenses should have which limitations period and so forth. But. What the classical law says is that the positive law is always embedded in a, no problem, <laughs> um, always embedded in a larger objective order of principles and should be interpreted in light of those principles. Um, and the classical law has always said that the positive law can never be fully determinate. This is a point that goes back as far as the Roman lawyers, it's emphasized by Aquinas, and then it's picked up even by positivists like H.L.A. Hart, who understand that because of the limits of the um, civil lawmaker's foresight and anticipation of hard cases or unforeseen problems, it can never be that the positive law gives answers to every possible question. It will inevitably be um, semantically ambiguous, it will be uh, ambiguous in light of unforeseen facts, it will be excessively general, it may be internally conflicting. 
Um, and at this point, um, the classical law supposes that the interpreter, whether or not a judge, must uh, read the law, if at all possible, to harmonize with um, the general background principles uh, of natural law and the use gentium, and uh, in some way make sense of the tapestry of law. And this is why the classical tradition distinguishes, as many European languages do, between two senses of law, lex and use. Uh, so in Spanish, these are lay and derecho, in French, loi and droit, and so on. English has the great misfortune, and I actually think that this is a profound influence on um, the positivism that is so characteristic of the Anglophone world. English, to its misfortune, has no stable version of this distinction and uses the terms law and rights in incredibly tangled and confusing ways. So law is the enacted positive law, use is the overall body of law that includes and subsumes lex but transcends it. Well, um, what then is the common good? What do we mean to say that law should be ordered to, oriented towards the common good? For purposes of the constitutional lawyer, bracketing the much deeper and more important purposes of uh, the theologian. For purposes of the constitutional lawyer, the common good is the flourishing of a well-ordered political community. The common good is unitary and indivisible. It's shared without being diminished. It's not the summation or aggregation of utilities. Uh, in its temporal aspect, it represents the highest felicity or happiness of the whole political community. And crucially, this is also the highest good of the individuals comprising that community. The picture is not that we override the good of individuals for the sake of the collective, or this, especially not for the sake of the state or anything like that. That is a false picture of how the classical legal tradition thinks. It thinks that uh, the felicity of residing in a flourishing human, uh, human political community is the highest good for individuals themselves. No man is an island, and the goods of individual and family life cannot be enjoyed in a decaying and chaotic polity. And that's true even if we can afford to live in a gated community and send our, send our kids to you know, private boarding schools or whatever it is, none of that will insulate us from the decay of the community surrounding us. And Aquinas typically uh, puts this uh, wonderfully with a very apt quote from um, Valerius Maximus. Aquinas says, the individual good is impossible without the common good of the family, state, or kingdom. Hence, Valerius Maximus says of the ancient Romans that they would rather be poor in a rich empire than rich in a poor empire. I think that's a profound comment um, by Valerius and uh, maybe a short description of some of the socioeconomic ills of the United States today is um, that there are a lot of people who would uh, rather be rich in a poor empire than poor in a rich, uh, poor in a rich empire. But I think that um, even those people have started to realize that they cannot fully insulate themselves from the decay of the surrounding political and social communities. Well, um, this uh, vision of the common good that I've laid out is then um, uh, translated into the use commune and uh, elaborated and becomes an incredibly rich and complex tradition full of internal argument, but it tries to elaborate uh, the goods or ends at which constitutionalism aims. Um, I particularly uh, mentioned the ragion di stato tradition in early modern Europe about which my friend and colleague Gladden Pappen has written um, important stuff. And uh, for the early modern uh, lawyers of the Jus Commune, um, the goods of uh, constitutionalism included in a very famous trinity, uh, peace, justice, and abundance, a Pax Justitia and Copia. Um, and part of my project is to extrapolate uh, these aims to modern conditions to include various forms of health, safety, and economic solidarity, um, all within a horizon of principles drawn from the tradition, such as um, subsidiarity and other principles that put 
uh, the role of the state per se and the role of civil society and family into the right relationship with each other. I should mention that um, uh, this kind of view of constitutionalism is a, it's a type of justification. It doesn't by itself prescribe any particular institutions or rules. It requires a kind of virtue on the part of those participating in the legal system um, both the lawmakers and the official interpreters of the law, like judges, the virtue is the virtue of regnative prudence. This is the special um, version of prudence oriented towards justice of the public authority who is charged with care of the race publica, care of uh, public matters. This prudence is by no means unstructured discretion. It is given shape by an account of the ends for which that discretion should be used, that of promoting the good of the whole community as a community, again, not as an aggregation of preferences. And of course, as I said, this regnant of prudence informs the exercise of determination. So to use another one of uh, Aquinas's analogies, uh, imagine an architect who's given a commission to build a hospital uh, for a city. Um, the purpose or end of the commission shapes and constrains the architect's choices, but it doesn't fully determine them. There's a range within which um, the architect um, uh, exercises a kind of faculty of prudence uh, appropriate to the architect's station and mission um, and uh, uh, decides what form a good hospital should take because it can take any number of forms although there are forms it cannot take. And, and this is how law so often works. Um, I think the more legal practice one does, the more obvious this becomes, um, that uh, so often the law gives us, um, at successive levels of specificity, a kind of aim or principle, and it is up um, to the uh, next level down to give it ever more specific and determinate content. Okay, um, let me briskly dispel some myths uh, uh, and misconceptions about the classical legal tradition that uh, one, one may hear um, in the pages of certain uh, journals. Um, the common good is not preferences or what I like or uh, uh, whatever the governing authority imposes at whim. One often hears, um, especially in America, I mean, indeed almost exclusively in America, one hears the claim that the alternative, only alternative to positive textual rules is a kind of unstructured discretion that embodies subjective preferences or policy arguments. But the Western legal tradition has always supposed that um, there is more to law than um, positive texts and that other binding sources of law and background principles exist and that those principles have ascertainable and objective content. We may have debates about them, we may make errors about them, but um, the tradition has never accepted the view that it is subjectivity all the way down or that there is no thing there that we can be interpreting and understanding. Any legal ontology that consists only of positive texts on the one hand and subjective preferences on the other um, is um, flatly inconsistent with the broad sweep of the classical legal tradition. Uh, and it's also, in my view, desperately impoverished. It doesn't account for how judges actually behave. It doesn't even account, as I said, for how American judges actually behave. A second uh, myth to dispel, in the classical legal tradition, um, I have heard people say there is no such thing as rights. Well, this is just wrong. <laughs> um, that claim is simply incorrect. Rights very much exist in the classical legal tradition. It's just that they're not defined in the same way as under legal liberalism. That is, they are not defined on uh, the basis of individual subjective autonomy. They are um, 
uh, defined and recognized as corollaries of justice, which is the constant aim of giving every person their due. Use is what is due to every person, and in this sense very much includes rights. On this view, rights have the common good built into them from the ground up. They are ordered to the common good and are recognized insofar as they contribute to the common good. Um, I go back to um, the Dean's opening remarks. This is a very different anthropology of rights than uh, a subjective anthropology of rights. It's one that sees what is due to uh, citizens and subjects of law as um, ordered to um, their objective nature um, and uh, supposes that ordering law to the objective nature of man must necessarily contribute to the flourishing of the whole community. Um, the uh, approach I am mentioning, uh, uh, advocating, by no means requires or presupposes uh, judicial supremacy. It does not license judges to rule as they see fit for the common good, all things considered, by no means. Uh, division of roles and allocation of jurisdiction is central to the classical legal tradition and was central to the American legal tradition in its classical form right from the beginning. Um, I return to, uh, uh, to the digest, um, quoting the jurist Marcion, the praetor, referring here to the urban praetor who uh, makes uh, rules for civil governance, the praetor is also said to render legal right use even when he makes a wrongful decree. The reference, of course, being in this case not to what the praetor has done, but to what it is right for a praetor to do. That is, um, in virtue of the praetor's office, the praetor does legal right even when the praetor errs and makes a wrongful decree. And that is the essence of jurisdiction. Put differently, promotion of the common good is a duty incumbent upon all officials in the system, on legislators, uh, bureaucratic officials, and judges. It doesn't follow that each official or institution in the system taken separately must make unfettered judgments about the common good for itself. That would be an example of what the logicians call the fallacy of division. How a constitution should be interpreted and how judges should decide cases are not necessarily the same question. Um, and in American law, uh, um, the, the framework taking this all on board said that, uh, and this goes right back to the founding era. Um, it's it's uh, in uh, founding documents and early cases. Um, and I especially recommend the work of an American legal scholar named uh, Judd Campbell on this topic. The classical legal framework in America said that the, uh, the legislatures were the primary organs that gave content to natural law and natural right and were the primary specifiers of the common good. The role of judicial review was to ensure that legislatures did law that is, to ensure that legislators stayed within the classical conception of law as a rational ordering to the common good. So American judges would review law um, to make sure it was not arbitrary or unreasoned um, because if it was, the legislator was no longer doing law at all and was acting tyrannically. But that framework was quite deferential. It said that um, it said that um, judges sh should only check whether uh, legislatures were uh, remaining within the broad bounds of this determination of reason. Well, um, I will uh, um, just conclude with a, a few words on the following subject. Um, I hope this is of interest to you, but uh, it's very much um, uh, a live, uh, even overheated controversy in the U.S. right now. Um, the few words I want to say are about the question why there has been such a revival of interest in the classical legal tradition um, in the U.S. and 
um, and also in the, in the United Kingdom. And I have a few thoughts. Um, in my view, this uh, revival is especially pronounced, it's unmistakable among law students, uh, young lawyers, young professionals, um, who um, admit a kind of overwhelming demand for a, a classical alternative to the usual approaches. Why is that so? Well, I mean, partly it's um, the usual desire of every rising generation to slay its elders, um, which is, uh, you know, a constant in human history. I just hope I'm not slain along with my, um, with my age cohort. I'm trying desperately to get on the right side of the rising generation. Um, but I think the reasons uh, go deeper as well. They stem not from anything intrinsic to law or legal theory, but from the state of the broader polity. I suggest a kind of paradox. As a polity becomes increasingly disordered, increasingly remote from a naturally well-ordered regime prom promoting peace, justice, and abundance, the paradox is that the claims of the common good and the natural law that underpins it actually become more visible and more insistent and less debatable. So it's very easy to, be, easy to be fashionably skeptical about the natural law when your society is functioning well, when everything is well-ordered and prosperous and uh, decent public morals are in a decent state. It's easy to write clever papers um, being skeptical about the natural law. But when the main tasks of civil governance are not being well taken care of, when the public sphere is increasingly disordered and indecent, um, uh, when, as, as in the US, the leading cause of death for adults between 18 and 45 is uh, overdosing on the drug fentanyl, when uh, a million Americans die in an ep epidemic, when disparities of wealth and inequalities of educational opportunity are pervasive, when the public sphere is in this way, um, chaotic, decaying, increasingly bitter and fractured, um, it occurs to a lot of people that there must be a better way of doing things. There must be a, a kind of flourishing polity that uh, we now miss because we no longer have it, which is a very human impulse. And there must be natural principles of reason, political order, um, and of course those should be part and parcel of our law. It's no accident, I think, that the last major revival of classical legal theory was just after the Second World War, when the idea that positive law does not exhaust the binding sources of law was vindicated at Nuremberg. I think on a obviously much smaller scale, the increasing um, uh, distemper uh, uh, sort of institutional chaos and um, uh, political division of um, the American um, social order has um, been the engine that's created this uh, revival of interest uh, in the natural law. Um, and may that revival continue. Thank you. Oh, should, I, should I, do we have questions? Okay, just one. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very interesting intervention. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for discussion because uh, uh, coffee is waiting for us. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, at least uh, I think for one two questions we can afford. Uh, okay, so there are two hands. Please. Uh, Thank you. The question regards the very concept of common good. You've offered a very clear and specific definition, which I thank uh, personally very much. But there are other authors, self-identified uh, as belonging to the traditional classic, uh, to the classic tradition, that define common good as a number of conditions for individuals to flourish. So 
I would ask, uh, how would you answer this other definition of common good? It's not the flourishing of the community. It's the conditions for the individuals to flourish. It's not the same. So I, I would like to clarify that. Thank, thank you very much. I think we can, we can wait for the second question. Uh, so please, uh, the second question. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Professor, for your, your excellent paper. Um, my question concerns some reflections which were offered by Alistair McIntyre at the very end of his book, After Virtue, in which he reflected on the fact that uh, we are governed now by people he described as barbarians, and one of the difficulties was that people didn't actually recognize that. Um, and if they, if they don't, it makes conversation rather difficult. Um, so I suppose the question is, how can we discuss natural law or propose it when people aren't, or people may not be aware of the fact that what's going on is unreasonable, irresponsible, unintelligent, and so on? As, as you wish. Yeah, thank you for, for both questions. Um, on the first, uh, as, as you know, and as people in this room can explain far better than I, um, Catholic social teaching, for example, says both things about the common good. So if you look at the catechism, both uh, strands of this are there. And um, because it says uh, both, I think we should uh, approach it on under the assumption that it's not at all inconsistent, and I don't think there is any inconsistency because, as I said, the classical uh, tradition supposes that the good of a flourishing community um, is itself the crucial precondition for all other individual and familial goods. That is, um, and that is why uh, temporally it is also the highest good of those individuals. So. Uh, when Gaudium at Space says that um, the common good requires um, the governing authority to uh, promote the preconditions for the uh, good, uh, the happiness of individuals, um, uh, I think the, the easy way to read that is um, not only consistent with but actually promoting the classical tradition is to say that the crucial precondition is the good of a flourishing community. And that's exactly my point about you know, you can live in a gated community, you can send your kids to private schools, none of that will save you if the larger structure is not, um, not flourishing. On the McIntyre point, uh, yes, I, I, I completely agree. We uh, often have this, I often have the sense of being governed by, by barbarians. Um, <laughs> but uh, towards the end of my remarks, I, I tried to um, say what I think is um, the, uh, the the built-in um, corrective, um, perhaps providentially, to that process, which is that um, although some persist in uh, blindness to the claims of the natural law, increasingly others start to become alive to the claims of the natural law precisely when they are most absent. Um, I don't want to be heard as saying this is some sort of uh, invisible hand mechanism that will automatically correct our ills, we have to go out and um, correct them. And part of how we correct them is by spreading the truth about the relationship between natural and positive law. But I do think that um, uh, uh, providence does not wholly abandon us and uh, helps awaken people to the problem precisely as it becomes most most serious. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation. I think uh, very inspiring for, for us and uh, opening also uh, mind uh, concerning uh, uh, different alternative uh, um, uh, of uh, Organ of uh, ways of organizing the political life of, uh, of the community.